There we go. So, you guys can hear me? Yeah, you can. Okay, welcome to episode uh, 107. Uh, it is a very scary episode, Halloween edition, because it turns out that we messed up the daylight saving timings. So some of you might have been waiting for an hour, and I'm happy to see you here. And uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, but yeah, we have a very full program. Uh, uh, Francesco here and Luis and uh, Sana is going to talk about a little performance issue that we bump into, where we went like, why is Quarkus not as fast as we thought? So, um, but maybe uh, Sana and Franz, you've been on the call before. No, Luis is, hasn't been. So I'm going to, Luis, so... So Sana has been high team lead performance. Franz is a performance guy. He was he's gonna talk a lot. So you gotta but Luis, who who are you? <laughs> Hi, hello. Uh, I'm Luis Barreiro. I'm from Portugal and I've been uh, working on the on the performance team for, for some time with Sane and Franz and other guys, uh, working on, on several issues uh, from Hibernate, uh, from Wildfly uh, back in the day. Um, I've also developed uh, Agrual, which is a connecting pool that's used on Quarkus, and uh, yeah, we've been done, done working many projects uh, around here. Awesome, cool. But let's g jump into it, Franz. I know you have a lot of uh, to share with us. So. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So let's start quickly. Uh, the The title of the presentation will be more clear by the end of the talk and the Halloween edition part as well, because as Max has already previewed or spoiled, probably the people will get scared a lot after this presentation. That is the usual way the people will feel by talking with me and Luis for some time. So let's move. Uh, we have talked about it in the previous uh, one of the previous workers inside. So we are using Tech Empower to evaluate the performance of uh, the Quarkus stack and not only for Vertex. Uh, maybe the people doesn't know what uh, uh, Tech Empower is. Is a benchmark, a public benchmark is made of uh, rounds that are performed after sometimes after each other's. And uh, the test itself, the benchmark itself, uh, is structured in a way that depending by which framework uh, is going to be tested, it performs a different type of workload. The type of workload are performance straight uh, one after the other and uh, are the one uh, that are outlined in the, in the green rectangle. So JSON serialization kind of, of uh, uh, load test, uh, single query, multiple query, cached queries, fortune, data updates, and plain text. It's not important to dig into any of them, actually. But it's important to know that uh, along all these tests, uh, the application server is uh, left on and be hammered by the different load generator that represent the different type of workload. Today, we are focusing into the plain text part that, as the name suggests, is a kind of a hello world for this kind of, of benchmark. But it's very important because given that it's simple, it's going to stress a lot concurrency and many uh, the CPU bound situation for our Quarkus server. We are talking specifically about the reactive stack, but whatever we are going to tell today, in, to say today during the presentation, applies the same way in any other way in which you can interact with the Quarkus. So it means even with the, uh, the blocking style and not just the React, the imperative and not the, the fully reactive one. But for simplicity, we will collect the results number about the, the fully reactive one. So this is the situation of um, the, the, the results of the Tech Empower plaintext benchmark that we observe in our Perf Lab. We have a huge many course machine, exactly very similar to the one that is used on the bare metal kind of uh, um, benchmark by Tech Empower in public. And the, the results... Uh, you know, as you can see, there is a huge difference between these two type of uh, test, not isolated and isolated. But what they mean? That's why I talked 
with you about the different type of tests. With the not isolated, it means that is the results that you can get on the real tech power because the server is left open during the whole execution of all the type of workload. And the right in the end, plain text is the unlucky one, is the, the last one to be run. And that's the kind of results you get. The isolated one, instead, is a kind of uh, workload that we used to run in our lab in order to focus on a specific kind of test. And, you know, it's kind of shocking. It's getting about half the performance, the peak throughput. It's a quite shocking situation. So we take a look if maybe it was a problem of our path lab. So we take a look of the results on the public tech and power. But sadly, the public tech and power doesn't allow to run a single isolated test. So we have used the other results of the other uh, building blocks of Quarkus to understand if there is something weird in the results. And uh, without focusing in the number itself. Just look at the percentage. So Quarkus is built on top of Vertex with many other stuff, but mostly, let's say, for this kind of workload, Vertex. And Vertex is built on top of Netty. That is a just a reactive HTTP framework, very low level. And Quarkus here is getting about nearly a bit more than 50% framework overhead over the other two. That it's a kind, no, it's bad. It's not what we expect, actually. So maybe there is something wrong, not just in our PELF lab. So uh, along with the, 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 the tech and power results in the public, uh, um, the, the public one, we can inspect uh, always uh, in this public uh, API, uh, in the public UI, uh, other metrics. One of the metrics is the CPU usage. We wanted to know if Quarkus is made its best. So it's pushing as far as it, as it can, if compared to Vertex, for example. And we can see that the benchmark is fairly CPU limited. So both Vertex and Quarkus are running, maxing out the CPU of, of the public server. So it means that you won't go any far, you know, that, that's the thing. And that means that the framework is the overhead. So uh, this is not a Quarkus Insight focusing on explaining flame graph. This one is a flame graph. What it is, uh, very briefly, and uh, why it's related to what we have done so far. So right after evaluating that effectively the number were real, uh, we, we profile the, the, the benchmark in our lab, and we collect the profiling data into this form to help us understand what are the, the you know, the, the, this easier way to detect what's the difference between the two kinds of behavior, isolated versus not isolated. And in order to understand this kind of visualization, I can just tell you that it's just a series of stack trace sampled of your application while it's running. And uh, the, the larger the rectangle are, the more CPU time, or better, the more CPU cycles are spent into this specific method that is represented in the, in, in, in the rectangle. And uh, in theory, our expectation as a Java developer is that not isolated run and isolated run will have a similar shape because there is no point that one method is going to cost more because the not isolated one is running alone after all the previous tests. So the kind of you know, behavior should be very similar, the dynamic. But in, in the violet rectangle, you can search the same violet rectangle in the next flame graph that is running isolated. And as you can see, the width has become so much smaller. And I can tell you that it is about 50% less costly than the not isolated run. That's quite important. So it means that the profiling data is telling us something. But what's bad is that uh, that profiling data wasn't nearly as useful as uh, we are used to be. Because by looking at the method that were being pointed 
by the uh, by the flame graph, we couldn't find anything interesting. So we were forced to go into the assembly, the, the assembly rabbit hole. Why assembly? Because uh, Java, when uh, the code is pre, uh, is very hot, uh, can compile code into proper assembly depending by which architecture is running uh, the Java virtual machine. And in this case, we have used a mix of different tools, including uh, operating system Linux uh, kind of profilers that are very fine grain. And uh, we observed that the most of the cost was by assessing two fields of the class object. The class object is something within the JVM. And let's say that you have an integer instance, for example, so any integer class. There is a class object named integer inside the JVM that does have these two fields. And we will look together what's the meaning of these two fields and how they are used by the JVM, given that our very fine grain profiler tell us that assessing these two fields has become very costly in the not isolated run if compared to the isolated one. So the uh, yes, please. Just, just a couple because I think if anyone here has listened to the episode you in back in '95, so it was back in July, we actually hinted there was something in the numbers that was like we couldn't dig out. That's literally this issue. So if any of you were listening to that episode and listen to France talk about how he tracked performance. That unknown we talked about to say, hey, there's something to be found is actually this one, right? Yes, exactly. It's exactly like that. So we, we now unveiling what's going on, what, what we suppose was a, a misbehavior, you know, a bug. And indeed, it's a kind of bug, but you have to de decide which one has to be guilty, if guilty, if their application or something different. More on later, more on this later. So let, let's take a look at, at the two fields. Secondary super cache fields is a field that is a single value cache that remember every time the last seen successful instance of or cast as success. While secondary supers contain an array of all the transitively implemented interfaces by that specific class. I know it's not easy to, to, to remember. That's why we have the next slide. So we will go through this very short uh, and bad and ugly uh, code to better understand how these two fields behave and how they are used by, by the just-in-time. So in this method, compare and serialize, uh, we are uh, using, passing an actual parameter of type integer. Integer implement two types of interfaces, comparable and serializable. So it means that the secondary supers field that contains all the transitively implemented interfaces uh, will contain comparable and serializable. The first time this method is being called with an integer type in, integer argument in, what happened is that on line six, an instance of against comparable has to be performed. So the just-in-time will perform a fast check against the uh, secondary super cache field that, remember, is the one that remembered the last seen successful instance of check. But given that we didn't done everything, so, uh, we didn't done any so far, it doesn't contain anything. It's null. It's empty. So it's the just-in-time is then forced to perform an ODN search, or whatever algorithm, but is ODN, sadly, uh, on the secondary super to search if uh, integer for real implements uh, comparable. It's going to find it, because we know that that is, is going to find it. And later on, there is a method on line 10 called use comparable that is performing a check, a, a cast, an explicit cast. In that case, given that that uh, uh, the just-in-time should perform another fast path check. We have uh, updated already the secondary super cache because the, of the previous successful instance of, and that means that uh, this fast path will be taken. There is no need to go into searching into the, the array because uh, the instance of 
and the, uh, the, the new check, the new cast operation are against the same type. But let's move uh, in line 14, that is more uh, interesting. In line 14, it happens a new instance of, but the fast path still contains comparable. So what happened is that this value has been invalid, discarded. So not discarded, better. This value is not considered because uh, it's a single value. We don't know yet if integer really implement serializable. So a new slow path searching into the array uh, of uh, secondary super happened. And given that it has success, it has succeed, the cache is updated with this new value. So serializable. And the subsequent fast check against the serializable can complete very quickly. What we have assist so far is a, a wasteful work, right? So given that is a single cached value, the logic of the just-in-time is making us to, to perform useless work because invalidate that value the first time. And if we perform another call against compare, compare and serializable with another time integer type, even the first instance of against comparable at line six is going to fail. Fail, it means that it's going to invalidate again the, the, the cached value because the last one seen was a serializable and so on. But Why this is that? Yes, please. That's only, is that even if you just one thread? It's only if you have multiple threads, this becomes a problem, right? No, no, it's a no. problem with the single thread here. We are not talking about multiple threads. We are talking about wasteful work. So if we have a sequence of instance of against the same concrete type that is eating different interfaces, what happens is that we perform wasteful work because a single value cache is not enough to remember the last scene. Got it. What happened? Negative. The same pattern I showed you before looks bad, right? It's exactly the code of Netty. So in Netty HTTP 1.1, into the decoding part, this is what happened, oh, the encoding or response. This is exactly what happened. Some of you will ask, oh, maybe it's the part that the profiler were complaining about. Trust me, no, it wasn't. It was a completely different part. And we can talk about it right at the end of the talk. So I'm not going to speak about the profiler's issue into looking into that, this specific problem, okay? But we can talk about it later. So if there is a later, <laughs> let, let, let me hurry up. So uh, in this code pattern, that is doing exactly the same thing. So if exists a concrete type, let's call it uh, default full HTTP message, random name, no, not that random actually, that implement both interfaces, HTTP message and HTTP content, if you execute this encode method, you are going to trash each time the, the last seen inval invalid value. And it is obviously a bad thing to waste work. And when we are fixed, we get back our performance at the right level. Or similarly, because the problem is that when you understand that specific code pattern, you start to see it everywhere. I'm not joking. It's pretty usual in a in few framework to, to use a pattern, pattern like that. In, indeed, right after, we fix it again on Netty. And it's not something, it's, it's not that Netty that is guilty of it, to be honest. It's just a, a shape of pattern that doesn't work well. It, it makes the just in time to perform very useful, uh, useless work. But the real question is why when we fix it, the performance difference is that huge. The performance difference is to get back the same level of performance we were having into the isolated run. So we are talking about twice the performance. In Java code, it's not IO, it's not disk, it's not anything special, it's not even a lock. It's just wasteful work. It could be that bad. So let's take a better look at the number with a very dumb and simple math analysis or so-called scalability is not actually scalability, but the machine used by Tech Empowering, the public benchmark is called Citrine. 
while our lab machine uses a very similar CPU. So it's the same CPU family, but it different in the number of core counts. So in Citrin is 28, in our perf lab is 64. By looking at vertex, plain text, for example, we noticed that going from Citrin that have a lower number of cores to our PEF lab that have much higher, we have increased the throughput till saturating the network inter interface of our lab. So all green. We don't know yet which, the, which point, but the point is we get better performance out of it. But with Quarkus, we are moving from 1.8 million of requests per second to 1.9. The improvement, considering that you are throwing much more hardware against it for a CPU bounded workload is very tiny. And we are talking about the code with the bug, so not the one fixed. That's important. How this shape of diminishing return by adding more resource, resources will look like. So there is a, a thing called the universal scalability law that try to explain in theory how a system is bounded to specific uh, uh, parameter uh, in order to define what's the model of scalability. Scalability means uh, how much throughput you get uh, by increasing the load. And uh, there are two kinds of parameters for this kind of uh, law. This uh, universal scalability law is bounded to the number of shared resources kind of makes sense. If you have a contention, obviously you cannot scale as much as you without having contention. And then there is a second parameter, very important, that is the one that, that represents the shape by the end, uh, in, in the rightmost part of the slides, the one with the red part, is called the crosstalk uh, coherence, crosstalk penalty, or coherency penalty. What we are getting in our case with Quarkus, is that we throw a lot more of hardware and we get a very tiny improvement. And trust me, we tried with even more core and at a certain level, we start to get a diminishing return similar to that shape. And that shape depends by this crosstalk penalty thing. But in a CPU kind of thing, what is the thing that uh, have a very complex coherency mechanism that could be related, that, that could be the, the one that by which depends this uh, uh, lack of scalability of our system. Guess what? Caches, obviously. So ev into every CPU there are a, a hierarchy of caches. These caches use a, a specific uh, coherency protocol that act very similar to, you know, it's like thinking that each cache represents a, a, a point uh, in a graph and you have to make them to communicate each other in order to have a coherent, uh, co coherency along everyone that is making use of them. It's not important to look at you know, the, 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 the protocol itself. It's important to remember that there is a coherency protocol. But let's go deeper a bit to understand uh, why is related to the scalability issue. The false sharing, pro false sharing problem. So false sharing, what it is and how it's related to caches and how it is related to this issue we are talking about. Uh, let's consider that you have uh, two different CPUs uh, and you have uh, two different threads that run on this CPU. Each thread is assessing its own cache. But let's try to think how this cache works. Caches have as a minimal unit of a transfer the cache line. The cache line is not a single byte. It's made of few bytes. On x86, it could be 64 or, you know, in different kind of CPU could be different. It's not important. The important thing is that it's a set of bytes. It's not just a single value. And let's look at the, the class two fields that we were talking about. We have the secondary super cache field that it could be, I don't know, eight bytes long. No? And the next field called the secondary super, that could be another eight bytes long. And every time you update the first one, the secondary super cache, you are forcing invalidation in the old cache line for every core 
that uh, would like to make use of that same value. Because remember, caches are made in order to communicate the value in a coherent way. So if you are a thread, you modify your secondary super cache value, the old cache line, if uh, it's shared by other cores, must be invalidated in this other course. And if for some reason they perform an instance of, of any kind that eat the slow path, they are forced to assess the array of secondary supers. When it happens, a new fresh value for the whole cache line should be delivered. Because from the point of view of the caches, they don't know that that cache line contains a different meaningful value by which only one change a lot. While the secondary super is, you know, is the type hierarchy. So you have implemented comparable and serializable and you don't have any more type you implement, right? So it's supposed to be immutable. But now you pay every time you access to it if the one near to you is going to change. And that kind of things, it's bad. And what makes it worse is that in the real world on server, the access of different caches have a different penalty depending by the, to the topology of the CPU. There is a thing called uh, uh, not uniform memory access that, uh, as the name suggests, uh, each one of group of, of CPU can have exclusive and uh, preferable access, faster access to a piece of memory. And they have caches that are located distant physically by the other one. So when you have a thing like full sharing, things are getting very bad because the cost by invalidating, refreshing, and getting a new line could be very high. And even if there is no, no slide for, for that, let's remember something coming you know, from university. When you have a graph and you have several nodes, what are the number of edges of this graph? It's exponential. Is n per n minus 1 divided by 2. And that's why you have a diminishing return. Because the more element you have to coordinate with, with a lot of interaction like that, that are false interaction, they shouldn't happen, the more you have a decrease in the throughput, exponentially, until you get a diminishing return. But we are not alone. So it seems that we are not the only one that have discovered it. Or discover is a bad word. The GDK thing that make use of it, this mechanism is built, is designed like that. The people that has written it knew it was possible. It was something that can happen. They didn't know it could happen that bad in the modern area, both because of the code pattern, both because we have many cores right now. And we, we would like to make use of it. And the reason is because it's a single, single value cache, you know. And then we have the full sharing problem that is obviously very bad. So there is an open issue for that. There is still another unsolved mystery, and we have completed. You know, the unsolved mystery is why, when we eat run in isolation, everything worked fine. So we we have found so far that there is some wasted work happening, and we fixed that. And when we get our performance back, we say, okay, yes, we get it back. And now, why is that good now? And we found that uh, it was something worse than just wasted work. It was a scalability issue. But uh, why, when you run just plain text, everything works so far? And uh, what we discovered by using uh, uh, other diagnostic tool is that uh, during the execution of tech and power, when uh, plain text happened, in isolation, the Java class used in that netty methods that I showed you before is always the same concrete type, always. While when, uh, when you execute a not isolated run in which previously you have even database driven like of load test, there are new type, new type of HTTP concrete type that are being called in the same method that I showed you before. And that's a, its a fact, okay? And we discover so far that in the JDK, there is a thing called the type profile that is attached to specific bytecode. And if you look at the second line on the left is checkcast and instance of two of these. 
and it uh, remember the test object by which it happened. So the concrete type, the integer, in, in our case of the pre previous example. And there is, there is a thing called profile pollution. So when you have many concrete type, depending by the, the capacity of the type profile, uh, the just-in-time can decide to not perform specific optimization. The typical optimization performed here is the monomorphic type card. So when you know that when the just-in-time it knows that a specific method or a specific bytecode is always hit by the same concrete type, whatever happens after it, including other new instances of check cast or other stuff, are being constant folded. So it means that they disappear because they can be computed and the just in time just in time can inject in, in the Java code something that you won't see actually in the assembly is injecting a check to be sure that there is always a single sim concrete type there. And if happen that the new type appear at the optimization happen, and the just in time should reevaluate that specific type profile. Let's apply this knowledge to our workload. So what we have said so far is that the plain text uses a single HTTP type. So there is no pollution and means that there are no other instances of. There is only a single one. With the, the other test running before plain text, so the not isolated one instead, given that you have a more type that can appear at a certain time, in the life cycle of the application, because it is always the same server that stay open for the whole execution is important, then it materialized the instance of. So it means that the code run is exactly the one that you have written. It's not optimized in a different way, in theory. Lesson learned, very important. Even in micro benchmark, and especially in benchmark, when you perform load test, you should account for type pollution if it's something that you expect it to happen in the real world. If you don't do it, the just-in-time will trick you, will cheat you, will we, we, we'll make the code faster, but so fast that probably it won't ever happen like that in the real world, you know. That's very important, this lesson. So the, the whole conclusion is that the class secondary super caching validation perform stupid, useless work. when with that specific shape of code. The noisy neighbor problem of field because of the cache that is changed often used by different thread makes a huge scalability issue to happen. And the just in time, ah, yes, right. please. Mark. Just, just your lesson there, you said about the, using specific types. Isn't it the lesson also just the general rule of make sure you test real use cases, meaning not just test one specific data set up but all different types, right? That's Yes, yes, yeah, right. that's the thing. Because it will make the code and the application to behave more similarly to what yes. would happen in the real world. Even if you are interested into a specific kind of workload, polluting by adding a, a, you know, a warm up that mess up with types could be useful to understand if you're, uh, yeah. if it's reproducible, obviously. Yeah. But you know, that, that's the lesson learned. And the third point is that the just-in-time can optimize it when the type pollution happens. That is what we have just said. So we are approaching the end of the presentation, in theory. How we diagnose it? So we can make use of specific Linux and Intel kind of tools. One is a perf C2C. You can take a look at a rel um, guide. And it's a kind of tool that tells you when there is too much activity because of false sharing. And it's not here, you know, the place to, to, to show the output of, of this one. But it's a kind of tool that kind of help. But it doesn't tell you exactly where. Or it could be, but you, there is some work required. Then in the very first flame graph, the one that was showing the not isolated case, we were having uh, in the bottom of the flame graph, uh, but you know, it, it's not important. It's just to, to tell you what happened. You, you can have a broken stack frame. So stack frame that report methods 
have a huge width, so they are important. It means the CPU time is spent there, but they have no ancestor. Remember, flame graphs are stack framed, so you expect the, the, the right st stack frame shape, the sequence of, of calls, and you won't have anything. When you get something like that, maybe it could be this issue, but we can talk about it later. Or you can make use of a specific, very fine-grained fine -grained tools to inspect the assembly, compare against what the operating system perf profiler tells you, and maybe by reading a lot of assembly, maybe you will find the issue. So, bad Halloween to anyone, you know, in theory. <laughs> that was what you did, right? Reading the... Yes. Me, not, not only. I, I mean, I, I received help but you know Luis probably would like oh please holly oh so i was just gonna say you read the assembly so that the rest of us don't have to yes that that's the point but the, i'm a single point of failure you know because, uh, <laughs> and it's not the kind of responsibility that uh, it, you know would like to have but that's why probably Luis gets some, something more to to tell about it because it is not exactly the end you know Yes, yeah, so, so yeah, this is where the, the performance team comes. Uh, we're, um, of course, our end goal is to fix it on, on the JVM level, but we understand that's going to take uh, to take a while for, for several reasons. Um, but in the meantime, and to, to help everybody that writes Java code, um, we are coming up with um, a tool that will hopefully help you. So uh, next next slide. So yeah, we are, on our team we already have uh, nice tools that we are using for for performance work, uh, like Hyperfoil, which is a load generator, Orium, which uh, is a repository to collect performance data, and um, QDAP is an orchestration orchestration tool as well. We have we have some nice things oh, and um, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, no, nice slide. And uh, yeah, we also um, came up with this um, type pollution agent. Um, that will going to, to help people uh, against this, this specific problem. Um, we have uh, help of um, people on the Java community, uh, namely uh, Raphael uh, from from the, the White Bloody project that's used uh, inside um, the, the our agent. Uh, next slide. We also had uh, great help from the, the end users from our uh, uh, Java team here at Red Hat. Um, they are very knowledgeable of all the internals of, of the JVM and also give us a great help. And um, yeah, so we come up with this agent and it will um, it will show you all the all the animals that you see in the, <laughs> on the on your code and will uh, will scare you if, uh, when you start looking at what what data it it, it provides. So. Um, as an example, which is uh, something that uh, yeah, people uh, may, may may look and, and say that oh, it's, 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 I, I won't have this uh, instance of problem, and um, yeah, but uh, we choose this example that that kind of appeared in, in in our code. So we, we've seen we've seen not we've seen different patterns, and uh, it's it's kind of hard to. Um, to even give a, a, an example that covers everything. So we have, we have seen several things. Uh, maybe one thing, I don't think Fran said it explicitly, like this is not unique to Quarkus, it's not unique to Netty. It's unique, well, it happens in every Java app where you have a piece of code that is hot, meaning you run through it so often <laughs> Right? You, or is, is one thread enough? I, still, I thought it was still for concurrency it becomes worse, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if, if you have one thread, it kind of still applies, but uh, the the price for for coherency is not uh, it's not that high because uh, it's not you're not yeah. kind of okay. sharing yeah. between threads, but you still um, you still ha have to write that that uh, super cache field and, uh, and read it. Yeah. Right. So basically, the, any any hot code that goes through this pays a price to do yes, an instance yes. of and, and, and if you do uh, and the more cores you have like the, the worse the, the it gets yeah, exponential the and, 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 and 
the yeah. performance go, goes down. Um, so we have this example that's kind of taken from one of the libraries in Quarkus, uh, where you have two interfaces, one that's internal, that's more specific, and one that's more general, uh, in this case, it's HTTP message. And uh, the use case here is that we, you have one interface that you want to expose in your API, and, and you have a, a more specific interface that you want to, to have more control and more, um, more data. Uh, more methods uh, on it. And, uh, in this case, we have like two types, but you, you, you could have a single one that um, implements the internal interface and, and uh, by, by extension, oh, they, we also yes. have a, a more general one. And um, yeah, and the, the, this is the type, the type hierarchy. So one, um, so two, two, two concrete types and two interfaces. And you can have a, a you can, as an exercise, you can write a, a benchmark uh, for it. Um, in this case, we have two lists, one for on the internal type and another one on the uh, API type, uh, more, more broad. And we just initialize the, the, those, those two collections with some, some objects. Again, we are, we are using two types, two concrete types, but you, you could, uh, it makes the problem worse, of course, but you could, you could have a single one, you still, you still experience, you still uh, experience this problem. So next slide. So um, this is the code that we're going to benchmark. So uh, it's nothing uh, really spectacular. Uh, it just show that in, the, in some part of your code, you're iterating throughout the internal Li the list of internal, um, the list with the internal type. And in the other part of your code, you're just iterating through the, the list that has the, the type for the, the, the API uh, interface, so more, more broad. And um, yeah, and then when you run it, you, 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 you look at the numbers and you go from two, two threads, four threads to six threads, and you don't see the throughput increasing. So uh, yeah, this, is, this is a really a, a case of a, a scalability problem. And uh, the reason for that is uh, the issue that we just showed. So how this does this uh, agent will help you. So the, the agent will start uh, with JVM and we'll inspect all the code that's loaded and we'll look for the, the instance of and check cast uh, operations. And uh, when the JVM exits, it will print a report. Uh, we, and we show you here an, an example. So it will show you the concrete type first, and then it will show you the number of times that the, the type uh, operation has been performed and, um, and what interfaces uh, the, 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 the casts have, have occurred. So in, in this case, we have, we have only two, but uh, we've seen in, in Quarkus that are, are types that, and not on, just on Quarkus, but even on the JVM, there are types that up, have like ten of tens of of interfaces, and uh, not only not all are a problem, but uh, the ones that are, it will be shown here in the report. Um, and then after, there's a, a section of, of traces, which is are the which are the places in the code that um, are actually performing the, the, the cast and you can see the, which, which, um, so, which so type just, succeeds. Yeah. Just, just so I get it right. So this, the agent will look for types that has a certain pattern and then also look for where it's actually no, it looks, an instance of? It looks for the, for the instance of, uh, and check cast, uh, bytecodes. Ah, and when, and when they occur, when they occur, it, it, it uh, counts the number of, uh, of types that is seeing, got it, uh, okay. and also where, uh, and that's kind of the, and you can see the here is on line ninety six and eighty five, but if you remember from from the code, we don't have any any instance of or 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 cast occurring. We're, we're just iterating through the list. So where 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 did it came from? So and for that you have to look at at the bytecode. And you have to remember uh, that the, the Java compiler is doing some tricks because of Java generics. Um, and in this case, it's uh, a bytecode index 22. You see that 
there's a call to the to a method called iterator next that because of, of type erasure on generics it returns a, a java object and the compiler uh, and the compiler adds a cast to the to the type of the of the list so in this case it can be either the, the internal list or the external list uh, because we have like two two loops occurring um but yeah it's uh yeah it's there uh, so it's uh, and we have seen um yeah this this is one example where we don't we, even without a, a explicit cast you're going to hit this this example there are others like uh, one that i've that i've seen um, I was trying to see more, but I've seen enough. Is the, the ArrayList class, which is a class that's used in many places, and uh, the, the ArrayList implements the list interface, the, the um, collection interface, and also if you use it on a on an enhanced loop, it will uh, call uh, it will be cast to the iterable interface. So yeah, and if you have like so, so basically almost every java app most likely will have this kind of pattern and 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 yeah, yeah and then depend on depend on how the code actually runs you might be affected or not but it's yeah. it's, and not, it's not, all, not, yeah. not only that it's scarier than that because if you're let's say that you've you've taken care of of, of on your library to uh, to like always use all these guests like a release to list and then another library that's completely related, related to you casts the, an, an release to a collection. And then suddenly you have the, like, so the, the two types being, being, um, being written on, on, the, on, the, on the cache for the, the release class. So, um, yeah. So, so, what, what, yeah. In, yeah. In, so far we haven't kind of, we don't have a recipe to how to fix these, these issues. Uh, so it, it, it depends. On several things, on the on the on the on the code patterns, it depends on if, if you control the, the type hierarchy or not. But like like the example that we show, if you have like a, an API type, an if an API uh, interface, you probably don't want to to, to change it. Um, so uh, so far we haven't we have solved it. We have solved some the the, the, the critical cases. Um, we're try we're trying to, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no there's no recipe that we 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 can, we can share at the moment. Uh, each case is the case, uh, and we we would like to to fix it in the in the in the JVM in the long run, but uh, yeah, it's going to take some time. Well, that's a happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so, let, so am I hearing right? So we have found that. The instance of in Java has for twenty plus years behaved the same way. Like I think the yeah. The, although, to be honest, uh, it only happens when when you're dealing with the interfaces. Interfaces. When you're, when you're doing uh, a, an instance of or a cast with a, with within the, the type hierarchy of an object, uh, you you it's fast. Uh, it's only when when yeah. you, because it's a single the type always have a, a super type. Uh, a single one so it's only when sure. you, you add interfaces that yeah uh, basically you can, you can multiple, multiple inheritance is the... yeah exactly, exactly. That, that's the funny so, part uh, you know max because uh, you get the it uh, in the only cases in which uh, you are allowed uh, you wish to use multiple inheritance because it maybe it represents a different traits uh, implemented by your concrete type it is true you can always found uh, no not always you sometimes you can find uh, other mechanisms like visitor pattern, you know, di dynamic yeah. dispatch yeah. Uh, to make you to guide differently the flow of the application. But sometimes you can't, like this okay. example. Yeah. And what I'm going to say is like, I remember, well, I feel like back in the day, like 15, 20 years ago, there was this, hey, instant self is not a big, a bad thing. They made it better. And I think they did. But then we started having frameworks and others using this code, and this becomes an issue. And uh, as far as I know, that the issue was actually found, as you said, by Intel, but it was understood as a special case. But what we are finding is that this is not a special case. This actually occurs very often. Yeah. 
Um, and in frameworks like Quarkus and any other framework on the planet, there will be cases of this that that if they are if they want to get true performance, uh, they will have to go and 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 and, and hunt those down, which we're doing in, in our stuff. Um, or or disable but, uh, one of the Numa nodes. That uh, I, I yeah. can't share who, but I yeah, can so, tell you that someone uh, has done something like that. Yeah. So. There's a question from Christoph here that says, so theoretically not applying the use Numa could help. Is that no? Uh, sadly, sadly not, because uh, use Numa doesn't apply uh, to class, as far as I know, and even to, uh, though uh, use, use Numa applies to heap objects. But most importantly, use Nuba is not uh, dividing the layout of a single uh, class of instance in a way that is more friendly. That it doesn't make uh, full sharing to full sharing to happen. And still, if you are sitting in a different Nuba node, you are access that object. There is no way that you are not gonna require to load it. You have, you still have to load it. So no, it won't help. Yeah, I think maybe it could help in some situations if if you have like different kinds of workload that then can be shifted to different more groups, right? But that's very unusual. And well, I wanted to add some some good news as well <laughs> because this has been terrifying so far. Um, yeah, so like Luis was saying, like we don't have a general recipe of like how can you fix this in all the scenarios, right? But what I really liked of the agent is that we it's it's reporting cases from like the most severe, like so you have your biggest problems on top, and then you have you know situations that you might want to ignore at the end of the report, and when we're looking at these in terms of severity, uh, we were able already to fix some of the most critical cases in Quarkus by being a bit creative with the code sometimes, right? So these are not patches that are looking very great in terms of design. Um, but, you know, when you're patching internal code and you're adding a good comment about why there is, why this is being done, and it doesn't really have any consequence to any other integration code or other code, and, and you get like, uh, 10 times or 100 times the throughput performance out of it, then I think it's worth doing it, right? It was, it. I remember when I started taking this one a bit more seriously, when I think it was you posting saying, hey, I um, I made this fix that this type agent, I think uh, Franz and Louis was suggesting to you, and you went from, like you, you say like 4 million instructions per, like some gigantic number, like it was, it was I was like, whoa, <laughs> that adds up in time. I mean, yeah, they're just ridiculous improvements because normally with performance, you know, it's all about like, oh, I got a 1% improvement. You know, I'm a rock star if I get a 2% improvement. Yeah. And here it's like, oh, no, I made it 10 times better. I made it 100 yeah. times better. It's just stupid. Yeah. yeah, normally it would take us six months of work to get a couple percentage improvements. And here it's 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 real fun right we we can get your application like 10 times faster with two hours of work uh, just because we have this new shiny yeah. toy <laughs> yeah but also but, it, it also depends uh, i mean the performance gains are huge on our on our big server machines because if you're running a, a small server you probably won't won't make as much of a difference uh, that's right yeah that's significant uh, yeah I, I tried with the four cores and still get it from 20 to 30. Because it really depends by the workload too. If you have a workload yeah. in which your application is the bottleneck, I mean, you can the CPU time is where exactly you need to improve. Just saving wasteful work, you get better performance. And if you can save the sharing to bite you, you get even better. So it's it's a that that's the the full parts of where it comes together in order to get better performance by this fixing this issue. So thinking about how much we have been spending in the past years, uh, you know, especially thinking of all the work I did with Luis and the other members of the performance team, how is it possible that we have never seen this? Or like, <laughs> Okay, what, what, you, what, what, what have you been doing the last couple of years? What, what the... <laughs> yeah, like we have been always spending time on optimizations, but like never on the big one, right? 
because this was, you know, like, like your title, like, why did you call it the invisible wall? Like there is a big wall yes. there and it hasn't yeah. been seen so far. Yes, I mean, the, the title uh, is taken from uh, a very nice uh, journal uh, speaking about uh, the fact that in the future, multi-core machine will have an invisible wall called memory. So you will have something you will eat badly. That is the way by which you are going to use uh, your memory. And that's exactly this. I mean, it, it's not the, the, the reason of the issue, but it's what makes it, this issue to be very bad. And the reason why it was invisible for us, for example, is because how profilers work. So a profiler search for bytecode byte index. And it is something that belongs ideally to some line of code written by the user. But if you have a just-in-time injected a type check that make use of the logic that we have talked about, when the profiler see it, is it oh, what it is? I have to, to find someone to, to guilt, a murder. Let me search it. And it's going to search forward or backward. And the very first one that is going to take is the one to blame. And you will get these very weird uh, flame graph in which you risk uh, when you have a lower contention. And that's the tricky part. If you have a higher contention, it's clear that it's broken, the profiling data. But if you don't have enough contention, because you don't test for it, for example, you will have a slightly ah. different shape. And then you say, oh, come on, there, there is this two string that is so wasteful, let me optimize it. And you spend a lot of time to optimize something that is completely, you know, the, the wrong thing to be fixed. You know, that's why it's so much common that the people expect it and it passes so unnoticed. So just so I'm, just so I'm understanding, so you're basically saying if you have a, a code base where you have like normal instance of your profile will spread in this code that gets injected by the decompiler will spread across it so it it won't sh the loss won't show up but in quarkers we had one that was very hot and that's you, why you we have been that. lucky we have been lucky yeah. that it was one to be super hot because that, that test was simple and because we were using a many cores machine because if yeah. we were like you know tech and power if uh, I can't get the flame graph out of tech and power, but if I could, I'm sure that the, the width of the cost of the rectangle would be so much lower that it can pass unnoticed, looking like, uh, you know, some, some code that, that is not fast enough. But given that that code doesn't exist, has been injected by, by the just-in-time, it's very likely that the one to be blamed is a wrong method near to it. Because the just-in-time perform optimization, like inlining, which basically the call of a specific method disappear, and because of that, it means that is everything straight, plain for the for the profiler. Every instruction belongs to different method, just because it, they have something yeah. that helps to address to which method they belong. But if there is nothing to track what's the source method, a plain, a randomly plain one will, will, will be taken. So, so one thing is to fix the JDK, which I know we are actually working on and giving them use cases, etc. Is this fixable in the profiler? Like this, this use case, I could see this happen, but there's no trace. Like you, the the profile can't see if the code is is JIT or not, right? So that they, I, I can I can speak for the JDK folks. Uh, I can tell you. What I think it is, the way by which is, uh, um, that code is emitted, uh, right now, it, it doesn't have anything that helps to track where it is. Maybe, maybe there yeah. is a way to do it. Yeah. Let's say there is a way. I'm more interested into the fix, the actual fix on the JDK, because the easier way to fix it has been proposed by John Rosa himself directly on the JDK issue. I've, I've spoken about. And our agent has been linked uh, as the last comment by some Oracle folk. So he's not a Red Hat yeah. JDK developer that looked but, into it. But, but I'm saying, yeah, well, one, but that's fixing the, this specific issue. But you could imagine there is other, other JIT optimizations that cause a similar un, being undetected. That's what I, 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 I hope not. <laughs> But the, the, let, let's say it happened. The, 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 probably the easier way to understand the, 
there is a problem is the single value cache. The very first problem. If you have a single value cache and you allow us to have multiple inheritance, something bad is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So it's difficult that it's going to be good. Even if you try hard to make it uh, cash friendly, it's a single value. Come on, it's bad. Cool. And if you've been looking for a justification for a 64 core machine and you couldn't quite figure out what the justification is, that you just this need to show not... this to your, uh, to your manager. <laughs> So, yeah, but yeah. Go, go ahead, Frank. No, I, I'm thinking how many people uh, has borrowed the very high core machine running a framework that are supposed to scale, and uh, they were forced to cut it out by in half if lucky. That means that they have spent that money, and that money is just a part of the story. Because the thing is that you will get such a higher CPU usage that is probably the worst green use case you can get because you know it's you spend a lot of cpu time out of nothing you know that's it's bad. How, can, can you put a number on that like well i guess it depends on the runtime but like the, what, the, what it depends about how, how much time is contended depends by yeah. how many types it contend against with it depends where the bottleneck of your application is because if it's not something on cpu side no contention. Yeah. I mean, because you, yeah. you are slow yeah. to make it contended. Yeah. And Max, I think you can probably see it fairly easily if you just do those those um, plots where you look at your performance, your throughput, or whatever it is that you care about against the number of cores. If that line isn't really quite close to straight at a four, nice 45 degree angle, then you know you have a problem. And you know that, as Franz says, all of the budget for the hardware mm -hmm. and all of the electricity that you're pulling into those cores yeah. is just the, a complete waste. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's the, um, but then the, 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 the issue, and this is the bad, or the scary news, right, is that this specific issue, probably in a, not, like, most people don't write Quarkus every day, right? They don't have a, as hot a point as Quarkus has. So theirs will probably be spread around. So they won't be able to pinpoint. It will just look like, oh, we, we're just spending like time. It, it, they, they can't plot it, uh, see it. But you're right that if you actually take the time to plot, okay, two cores, four cores, eight cores, 16, 32, 64, you should, you should see a linear, well, almost linear, um, and if you don't, then yeah, you have an issue, but yeah, that's the, the thing. so no, but that's, this is super cool. Like, well, super scary and super cool. And, um, what, what's the, what do we tell, what, what's the advice to people who are listening out here and hear this story, scary story, just wait for the data key to fix it or should they be scared by default? I guess it's not, is, is there a way they can check? If they affect it or not, I guess. Run the agent yeah. and fix yeah. uh, everything. No, just joking. <laughs> it's bad. Your your bosses won't be happy about it. Yeah. No, it, it depends. That's always depends. The, the first yeah. thing that we notice is that we couldn't scale. So if uh, scaling is not a problem, then you can think about being green, as we have said. So maybe you can make a better use of your CPU time. And that's a secondary yeah. reason you should look into that, into that. And then later on, you can find, uh, right now, just the agent. Because I don't, uh, unless you really want to spend a few weeks reading assembly, that's something that I definitely want to suggest you to do. You know, my wife wasn't tapping as well, believe me. I was so sad and hungry all day long. But, you know, say that, uh, Probably using the agent is the best way. If you find that, that the kind of pattern that it shows are so idiomatic that, oh, come on, should be fixed on the JDK, let's write to us. Because we are collecting all these cases in order to explain to the JDK folks that uh, that kind of issue won't happen just because you made it something wrong. But you are just writing, yeah. you know, idiomatic Java code. Yeah. No, and and yeah. remember, yeah, rem oh, yeah, no, I just wanted to add that it's it's very, very likely that everybody is affected. You know, any any code that we have looked at is affected. But to some degree, right? You might be a bit less affected yeah. and it does maybe it's not a big deal for you, but Yeah. Uh, it's it, it's affected. a case of <laughs> it's a it's a case of a thousand paper cuts, right? Like there's just 
each one of them might not be bad. But if you get enough of them, then 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 it hits. Yeah, but also um, just one of them, if it's positioned in the wrong place, yeah, <laughs> this can, can be really strong effect. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, and although yeah, you know, we have seen this also, like as an experiment, uh, you know, we have also the, the performance team also working on other products. And I took one of the patches I developed on Hibernate and, and, and gave it to my colleagues testing uh, uh, Spec J. Now this patch was completely prototype, not finished, and only applying some small changes that we learned from the Tech Empower Quarkus uh, use case, so a completely different use case. And even just giving that patch, which was developed in like 20 minutes experiment, it was already giving a noticeable performance improvement on, on SpecJ Enterprise on the other side. Which is... Yeah, that was the, the 5% thing you mentioned? Yeah, or... yeah approximately. Yeah. yeah. And it's or yeah. Really which doesn't... Us... Yeah. It makes us eat a whole bunch of performance advice. Because like normally we always say, you know, don't try and do this really elaborate tuning in your code. It's not worth it. The fastest code is idiomatic code because that's where the what? JIT has optimized. And for this, yeah. we just have to code, it. but don't use interfaces. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah. last time, last time France was on, we learned that you have, you'd spent, if you have like, uh, you should null out your references, right? Because I don't, then you had the, what was it, that probably called, where the new generation uh, would hold on to the old one or vice versa, right? Um, so basically, Francis is the anti open DDK. He's like teaching people how to do bad code to run well. Um, yes, yeah. exactly. Why you don't rule out that field? <laughs> oh, come on, there is yeah. the GC. Nah, yeah. no yeah. GC. But I think that's, that's the, the, the uh, I think, and this is what you said, like, like, uh, we've found these cases where things have been, been, been taught in school and by the ADK team and Java team, like these are fine to do. And they are fine to do in 95% of the cases. So it's not like don't do this. It's just if it gets to be in a hot spot, then you, 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 you hit the problem. Yeah, to, uh, to, to end up on a slightly happier note, uh, when we first run the agent with Tech and Power, I was expecting to see hundreds of of cases of uh, of uh, of this issue, and um, yeah, we got like fifty or something like that, and most of them were not uh, that high. Uh, we we're just having a few times, so we kind of have like ten or fifteen types that we really have to 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 look at. And um, so yeah, so it it kind of happens all the time, but uh, sometimes the, the compiler is, is smart enough to optimize it, and uh, <laughs> yeah. So our call to action for people is, you know, enjoy your Halloween. It's scary times. Uh, this code, this bug or feature, what is it called? Feature bug of the data K uh, regarding behavior. Of, we, behavior. Sorry. Yeah. This behavior uh, will affect you, but Hey, if your Java programming has been fine for 10, 15 years, it's okay. Like Java is still fast. It's just to be found out. We can make it even faster by by doing this, and by running the agent, you can hopefully identify those issues. And if you do find issues that looks that seem to be happening in Java code that you find is like normal, uh, I think France is very interested in 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 getting those examples because the JDK team has known about this issue, but at least until now, until France showed it, it was kind of seen as a special case or or non recommended code but that's yeah anything we can get to show that hey this this is also happening in normal people's code would be a good thing and then we will help fix it in the data k so yeah i is that it is that the last thing here and then louis get to say thank you and for the work and have a nice halloween i guess <laughs> cool we have more time thank you guys and uh, See you on the other side. Bye-bye.